Good morning and welcome to Worship at Trinity. It is so good to see so many faces. This is wonderful. This is lovely. This is lovely. Uh, today we are not, yes, we are not uh, having lemonade on the lawn today. There's some sprinkles that were taking place and uh, it's a bit chill. So we are going to skip that today. Uh, perhaps maybe hot chocolate next week. <laughs> it might be in order. Uh, for announcements today, uh, this Sunday, um, as a church in the Canadian Shield, we, we hold prayer for St. Andrew's United Church in Massey. Uh, this coming Tuesday, uh, on the 26th, we have our Zoom lectionary Bible study, and the link is in your email. And anybody is welcome. We pick up a new we pick up new lectionary every week, so it's uh, uh, interesting and um, a creative conversation, and it's for everyone. Wednesday we have an art outreach in the basement, and there are spaces for eight, and it's a it's a pastoral care kind of an activity. So I know that there are some folks here that have joined, at, but we are going to do it again. Uh, so hopefully. Uh, you're able to attend. Wednesday, October 27th, this Wednesday, we have a council meeting at 7 o'clock by Zoom. And yes, Karen and Dorothy, thanks for your contributions for muffin making. But yeah, keep in mind uh, the 17th and see what your calendar looks like. If you can, if you can bake muffins, uh, then uh, just connect with Faye. And we have uh, an important meeting next Sunday after church. It's uh, our congregational meeting on, uh, on Halloween, so you should already know that. Don't, you can come dressed up, it doesn't matter. You can <laughs> come as you are or come with a mask, it doesn't, what? Come with a mask. Yes, come with a mask. Uh, but we do have a meeting right after church, the congregational meeting. And you can, if you're not able to be here, you can join by Zoom or over the phone. But we really hope that you can be here. Uh, and we have an important affirming ministry decision uh, to make for this congregation. To get more information about that, uh, look at your, at your weekly email. Uh, and it, it, it's entitled Pre Preparation for the Congregational Meeting. So, so take a look at that. And now we're going to hear about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. You may be checking in on the Facebook page to see what is happening over these 40 days of, of engagement on anti-racism. Some, some incredible stories, some great videos, uh, and I just saw my, my good chum, Adam Kil Reverend Adam Kilner, who is, who is, uh, yes, who is today's uh, story. So um, take, a, take a look at that. Uh, it's on the United Church of Canada website. It's also one that we post. Turn and focus, and as we call on God, we light this candle as a symbol of the light of Christ, which cannot be held back by distance, which shines in each one of us, no matter where we are. And while Marlene is sharing the acknowledgement of territory, it is it is hope that. When you hear these words, that they don't just become uh, like Peppermint Patty and, and Charlie Brown's teacher at the front of the classroom. You know that. We hope that there is an intentionality of hearing the words and considering what our role is, what your role is, in how we can be more intentional. Let's listen. Long before those of us who are settlers, and those who are descendants of settlers came to this land, there were people here. Many nations of people lived, and still live, on the land we call Canada, given responsibility by the Creator to be stewards of this land and all that lives on it. We know these people as indigenous. Today, as we remember what it means to love our neighbor, let us give thanks for the indigenous peoples of this land, and let us remember 
that we worship God on the historic territory of the Wanapate First Nation. As Christ's people, let us be people of love, of truth, and of reconciliation. For our call to worship this morning, we sing to God as we prepare our hearts and our minds for this time of worship. Let us sing, Lord, prepare me. Forgive us when we choose privilege over gratitude, status over service. Call us to greater faithfulness to Christ's way. Amen. And let's respond with our words of assurance with exuberance. Your sins are forgiven. Pardon me. Your sins are forgiven. What do you mean? Your sins are forgiven. Who are you to tell us this? I'm not telling you. Christ is. God is. Your sins are forgiven. Our, Our sins, sins are, are forgiven. forgiven. 
God is like an artist, creative and unpredictable, always busy making and remaking everything brilliant and new. God is like a mother, strong and safe. You can crawl up into her lap whenever you want to, and she will hold you until you fall asleep. God is like a father, gentle and safe. He will put you on top of his shoulders and give you a bird's eye view of creation. God is like three dancers, graceful and precise. They move to the same music in very different ways, showcasing all of God's elegance and rhythm in your life. I think about the Trinity, and I think about the three dancers that God is, God, Jesus, and the Spirit. God is like a rainbow, vivid and full of color, a dazzling reminder of promise and hope for all people after a storm. And not just a storm of weather, of thunder and lightning and rain, but a storm, storms in our lives, <coughs> tough times. God is like a best friend, faithful and true, closer to you than even your brothers or sisters your siblings. And because we know what God is like, we know that. And there should be a drum roll. Who's going to give us a drum roll? We know that God is kind. God is forgiving. God is slow to get angry. God is quick to be glad. God is happy when you tell the truth and sad when things are unfair. She is your protector. He is trustworthy. They are your friends when you feel alone. God is hope. God perseveres. What is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world throughout all time have answered in many different ways. Keep searching. Keep wondering. Keep learning about God. But whenever you aren't sure of what God is like, think about this. Think about what makes you feel safe. What makes you feel brave? And what makes you feel loved? That's what God is like. If, if you want to get this book for your family, for kids, grandkids, it belongs on your shelf at home, get this book. It's a beautiful We're going to sing a song of comfort, Cradle Me in Your Arms. And we'll do it in English and French, and then the English again with some actions.
And um, we may just adopt that as a song to sing after our young and young at heart. Now a time for Thanksgiving gratitude and mission. Uh, today we give thanks for the Manitou Intentional Learning Community, and specifically the team. Its, it's short form is MILK, and Faye Moffitt is one of the members of the team. This team brings incredibly rich and meaningful learning and awareness uh, that is available to, to all folks in the United Church. In, initially it was in the Sudbury area, and now it's stretching from anyone from Thunder Bay to North Bay, uh, folks in our communities. This uh, yesterday, just yesterday, uh, Allison and Faye and I uh, joined up with 30 plus folks to attend a workshop called UNDRIP, and we've been talking about this for, for several weeks now. The United Nation Declarations of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP. You've heard the announcements, and this was, a, this was an awesome interactive workshop that incorporated biblical scripture of covenant with indigenous treaties, and in particular, the use of the wampum belts. So stay tuned, because we're going to be incorporating uh, some of this learning into, into future worship services. Your support is there when disaster strikes making a difference in the lives of those most at risk. When emergencies strike, people need help right away. First with the basics, shelter, food, clothing, and then with rebuilding. Increasingly, people around the world are facing a variety of disasters. Climate change, health crises, food insecurity, and violent conflicts that forcibly displace thousands are just some of the catastrophes that affect millions of people every day. The United Church is part of a worldwide network that makes a difference in the lives of those most at risk. The United Church partners in ecumenical relationships in over 120 countries mean that we are on the ground ready to help in times of emergencies. Recently, generous supporters have helped people struggling as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the devastating explosion in Beirut, and the earthquake in Haiti. From vaccines to hygiene kits, to food, to farm implements, your support is there when it's needed most. In return, our partners minister to us in a variety of ways, including spirituality. The United Church of Christ in the Philippines mission and service partner shares this prayer with us. Let us pray together. Most gracious and merciful God, amidst the din of howling winds, above the noise of rampaging waves, atop the earthquakes and the shaking of the earth, we hear your voice. Be still and know that I am God. Yes, even in times when we are prone not to be still, at moments when we are sorely tempted to resort to flight, we hear you and we pause to listen and to reflect, to stand still and recognize that indeed you are the God who is with us, that it is not in the wind or waves or in the earth's tremors that you speak, and that even when we walk in the shadow of the valley of death, that we are not alone. That even when we are put in the crucible of a fiery furnace, that you are there to save. In times like these, you speak to reassure us through that still, small voice, through the concrete acts of solidarity of partners and friends, through those who lovingly stretched out their helping hands to those ravaged by the storm, to those who are desolate and in despair, to those who are left with a threadbare of hope. In times like these, you assure us that we are not alone. 
that we have sisters and brothers who are moved to walk the Lonesome Valley with us. We thank you, for in times like these, your love and care are made more manifest and incarnate, made alive in concrete deeds of loving kindness and compassion. To you, we return all glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for giving generously to mission and service. Sometimes it's so easy to complain that things are not fair, to concentrate on what we want rather than what we need. Today in our giving, may we acknowledge God's overwhelming love. In our giving, may we acknowledge this love that will provide sufficiently for us if only we would respond. Let us present our offering. Let's pray. Holy One, we delight in giving back and paying forward through our gifts and donations here today. Bless these gifts abundantly, for they benefit so many of whoever they serve, wherever they serve. Amen. Join us in our second hymn, O oh God, Why Are You Silent? Sounds like another question.
The Lord is humble and satisfied. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. In 10 to 17, Job's fortunes are restored twofold. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapa. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children, four generations. And Job died old and full of days. These words have caused us to reflect. As we have listened, so we have thought deeply. As we have listened, so we have been inspired to change. As we have listened, so we have considered a community response. As we have listened, so we have been moved to act. These words give us strength. God's blessing is within them. Amen. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. God, we ask that you would blow through these doors and stir us up. God, we ask that you would have us lean into what it is you would have us here today. What is it? In our questions, we pray answers will fall. Lord, speak to me that I may speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the past weeks, the story of Job has been offered as a scripture to preach on. I don't think anybody is really bitten. <laughs> Until today. We may have missed out on hearing the Old Testament readings, but today we catch the end of Job. We catch chapter 42. We hear of what sounds like a happy ending for Job. Job is blessed by God, and all that Job has lost has been restored with many livestock. He's blessed with children and lives to a ripe old age. Great, right? Well, like watching any TV miniseries, often before the new episode plays, they give a recap of what has taken place previously, in case you missed it or forgot in order to consider what God has given to Job in this final chapter, we need to look at 
what happened over the first 41. And no, I'm not, I'm not going to read them all. But I will attempt to summarize this incredible story. Once upon a time, there was a man named Job, a good man. Job loved God. Job was blessed with many children, as well as fields and fields of sheep and oxen and donkeys and camels. And with all of what Job owned, he had loads of servants to help him out too. Apparently, Job was a great man among the people of the East. Now one day, Satan and God met, and God tells Satan about how good a servant Job is to God. And Satan's response is, oh God. <laughs> Job is only like this because you've been so good to him. You gave Job lots of children and all these animals and servants to help to tend to them. Job's got it made in the shade. Of course Job thinks you're good. So Satan asks God if he can test Job's goodness. God says, yes, but the only caveat is that Satan isn't to kill Job. <laughs> this already doesn't sound like a pleasant test that's coming. Whatever is up Satan's sleeve. Now Satan gets busy and tests Job by taking away all of Job's family, killing all of his children, all of Job's servants, and all of Job's animals. All of Job's livelihood is gone. Satan thinks that Job is going to do an about face with God and curse God because of the tragedy Job has now endured. But Job does not. So Satan and God meet up again. And God tells Satan once more how good Job is to God. Satan's up for the challenge. A test. Another test for Job. Job has now been covered in sores from head to toe. And if these sores aren't enough, Job's wife is well aware that Job has already lost all. And she's now just going to give him a little piece of advice. She's going to tell, she tells Job, to curse God and die. Thank you, wife. But Job, Job does not. Job keeps on saying that he is good. But he's starting to wonder if God really is good. Job's initial theology of thinking good things happen to good people now seems pretty bogus. And Job is considering that the disasters which have been placed on him, well, they're not so good. And what seems to be so distressing, most distressing, to Job is the fact that he keeps ask, asking God, why? Why? And God is silent. This silence of God seems to hurt Job worse than any sores on his body, worse than his children dying, worse than any of his poverty. To Job, God's silence is the worst. And, and isn't it? <laughs> isn't it just the worst? Have you ever found yourself yelling to God with your own cries? Why? Why, God? And hear nothing. I know I have. Now, Job's got three friends. And they all hear of the awful things that have happened to him. 
So like good friends, they comfort you initially. But then they begin to think that maybe Job isn't good because all these bad things have happened to him. So Job has no interest in his wife's suggestion to curse God and die. And, and, Joy, and Job, Job stifles his friends who defend God rather than defending him. Job is going to the source, which is God. And that is to say, whether God will listen to Job or not, Job has much to say. And he spills out his grief, and he spills out his pain, his suffering and his loss, and yes, God's, God's deafening silence is enormous. Job takes much time and effort to beat on God's door. Job cries. He's insolent. He's indignant. He's sarcastic. He curses and attempts to reason with God. Which seems to boil down basically to that question that he's asking God. Why? Sound familiar? God has now heard enough from Job. If you look closely to chapters 38 to 41 of Job, God's response to Job comes in the form of many questions. God says to Job, brace yourself for these questions that I'm going to ask you, Job, and then I expect your response. Now, I'm just going to give you a small example of what God asks Job. And they're really not questions. They're really not questions at all. What God is asking of Job and what God is asking of us when we ask, why God? Here's a taste. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Have you commanded the morning since your day began and caused the dawn to know its place so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? Can you lift up your voices to the clouds, your voice to the clouds, so that the flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightning so that it may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Is it by your wisdom that the hawk soars and spreads its wings towards the south? Isn't it your command? That the eagle mounts up and makes its nest on high? And on and on and on, these questions go on. Take a look at it in Job. It's fascinating. These are the questions God asks of Job and asks of us. Question after question, Job asks, God asks Job where he was when God was creating the earth and filling it with amazing things. Meaning, it's not possible for Job or any of us to really understand God's ways. God laid it all out, all mighty and powerful, the questions that neither Job or us have the answers to, yet God expected Job to respond. You know, what are you going to say now, Job? But Job says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now, my eyes see you. Now my eyes see you. I'm drawn to how Barbara Brown Taylor's book, An Altar in the World, describes this moment when she, and she says that God cares enough about Job to show him things no human has ever seen. 
But this does not place Job at the center of God's universe. And after everything God says, it is not entirely clear, but Job is satisfied with, with God's answer. He sounds relieved to be put back in his place, holding fast to what God has said to him. I appreciate the description that Debbie Thomas shares when she speaks about Job's experience of pain and suffering and of our own experience of pain and suffering. She says, sometimes the Spirit bruises and blesses us at the same time. Wrestling with God's Word looks different for each one of us and yields results specific to our own circumstances. So when our bruises form from the knocks and the sucker punches that this life dishes out, Thomas considers that we might ask ourselves, when suffering comes, when loss shatters our belief in a predictable world and a safe God, what will we do? Will we opt out? Will we close our hearts around our wounds and never risk life again? Or will we participate in lavish, unbounded love of God who adores a created cosmos of God's own making that just so happens to include an unknown future, destruction, chaos, and disorder. We're free to choose, just as God is. We're free to risk our hearts or not, just as God does. Next Sunday, is an important one at Trinity Gabriel. We will celebrate the church's 103rd anniversary. And at a congregational meeting after church, among other business and decisions that we will vote on, there will be a significant vote to decide if Trinity Gabriel is to become an affirming congregation. It is an exciting time, and I cannot, I can, I can only look ahead and look to this children's book with questions like, what is God like to have me sit on my decision making of my vote? Job wonders. And we wonder too. And yes, this is a very big question. The book shares that whenever we're not sure about what God is like, we're asked to think what makes us feel safe, what makes us feel brave, and what makes us feel loved. That is what God is like. I pray that we can say this in our own hearts, and minds, whatever pew we're sitting in and whatever community of faith we come from. Some questions that we can consider when we speak at visioning meetings and at Trinity's dreaming sessions about what we want to see our church do and be. We may want to explore this question. Who in our community or church is silenced or kept in the background. We know how Job managed God's silence. And we know what it's like when God is silent for us. Let us, as a church, show and live out what God is like in our actions, in our thoughts, and in our words. Job does one thing in the scripture lesson that cannot be overlooked. 
In verse 10, Job says, or rather, the Lord says, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. Job prayed for his friends. So like Job and ourselves, sadness and despair will scar us and will leave us asking why. We can be reminded of what God is like to give us grace and comfort. And the scars remain, remain our brokenness. Yet what makes us feel safe, what makes us feel brave, and what makes us feel loved is all grace all the time. Job says, I heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now, now my eyes see you. Let us pray for each other, Trinity. Let the world see Christ in you and discover Christ in each other. Let's pray. Loving God, you show us what you're like and what it means to be kind, to be generous and compassionate. When we're feeling deeply the bruises of this life, we miss the blessings We wandered or rushed through this week, too often missing the beauty around us, too busy to call a friend, too lonely to ask for help, maybe too frustrated to forgive. Still you surround us, and you love us, and you call us together. Thank you, God, for your love and compassion and companionship and that you challenge us like Job, reminding us of just how big you are and that we're not. Loving God, you show us the way. Thank you for your freedoms we enjoy. Freedom to choose, freedom to love, freedom to worship, to gather without fear of persecution, freedom to live into all the possibilities with which you bless us. Help us to cherish such freedom, to choose wisely the best ways to live, that others also might know such freedom. We pray for people who lay down their lives and their livelihoods in order that your love might reach into the violent and fearful places in our world and in our lives. We pray for the people of Syria and Afghanistan who seek to find the balance of freedom and responsibility for governments and agencies who offer leadership in times of uncertainty where human freedoms and rights are trampled. Loving God, show us your way. We pray for relationships that have been broken between parents and children, between siblings and partners, between neighbors and friends for the hurtful things we say. Forgive us from the hurt we carry. Release us. Pour your healing presence onto each one of us that we might be whole in mind and in body and in spirit when we are on our knees shouting, Why God? God, show us your way as we pray today for all those who need to feel a group hug from this congregation of believers who are tired, who are weary, worn. We pray for the scared. We just need to feel that shelter only you can provide. God, we bring all of our prayers to you now. 
hear our prayers. And now we pray together the words you taught us. Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power of the glory, forever and ever. Amen. What is God like? In our final hymn, we sing that our God is like a river of tears. God is like a sunshine of blessings, like a star-studded sky. God is like a bird in free flight, like those eagle wings in the story. Could you picture it? Those wings that were shading those beneath them. This is what God is like. Let's sing like a river of tears. <laughs>
God's girl, girl, God's world we go. Great. 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 Ready to live our gratitude in the world. And thankful that we have been blessed. And eager to be a blessing. In all the places life calls us to be. And may the love of God surround you. The peace of Christ be within you. And the power of the Holy Spirit sustain you now and always. Amen.